Um, before we get started, uh, once again, my wife has encouraged me to make sure to say something funny before we start. So I've got two. Uh, this was written by a woman uh, several years ago. Maybe some of you get this stuff. Uh, I tend to keep it, so uh, you've probably heard this before. Several days ago, I was leaving a meeting at a hotel. I desperately gave myself a personal pat down. I was looking for my keys, but they weren't in my pockets. A quick search in the meeting room revealed that there was nothing there. <clears throat> Suddenly, I realized I must have left them in the car. Frantically, I headed for the parking lot. <clears throat> My husband has scolded me many times for leaving the keys in the ignition. My theory is that the ignition is the best place not to lose your keys. <laughs> His theory is that the car will be stolen. <laughs> As I burst through the door, I came to a terrifying conclusion. His theory was right. <laughs> the parking lot was empty. I immediately called 911. I gave them my location. I confessed that I left my keys in the car and had been stolen. Then I made the most difficult call of all. <laughs> honey, I stammered. I always call him honey in times like these. <laughs> I left my keys in the car and it's been stolen. There was a long silence. I thought the call had been dropped, but then I heard his voice. Are you kidding me? He barked. I dropped you off. <laughs> <laughs> now it was my time to be silent. Embarrassed, I said, well, can you come and get me? <laughs> he said, I will as soon as I convince this cop I didn't steal your car. <laughs> <laughs> this one is a, is, a, is a little more serious, a little more tender. Four brothers left home for college. They became successful doctors and lawyers. One evening they chatted after having dinner together. They discussed the 95th birthday gifts they were able to give their elderly mother, who had moved to Florida. The first said, you know, I had a big house built for mom. The second said, I had a large theater built in that house. The third said, and I had my Mercedes dealer deliver an SL600 to it. I assume that's a pretty good car. Yeah. The fourth said, you know, mama loved reading the Bible, and you know she can't read anymore because she can't see very well. I met this preacher who told me about a parrot who could recite the entire Bible. It took 10 preachers almost eight years to teach it. I had pledged to contribute 50,000 a year for five years to the church, but it was worth it. Mama only has to name the chapter and verse and the parrot will recite. The other brothers were impressed. After the celebration, Mama sent out her thank you note. She wrote, Milton, the house you built is so huge I only live in one room, but I have to clean the whole house. <laughs> Thanks anyway. <laughs> Marvin, I'm too old to travel. I stay home. I have my groceries delivered, so I never use the Mercedes. But it was a good thought. Thank you. Michael, you gave me an expensive theater with Dolby Sound and it could hold 50 people, but all my friends are dead. I've lost my hearing. I'm nearly blind. I'll never use it. Thank you for the gesture, just the same. Dearest Melvin, you were the only son to have the good sense to give a little thought to your gift. The chicken was delicious. <laughs> so, as, uh, as, as we get started, Tim's, uh, Tim's comment made me think of something. A few years ago, uh, a lot of you were here when we were supposed to have Mary Eisenhower take us yes. to the Eisenhower yes. Museum. And every once in a while, Mary and I have become close friends for a lot of reasons, but she calls me every once in a while to, to let me know that something, you know, I, I, I talked to her one day and she said, well, I'm on my way, I couldn't take your call because I'm in Cairo and I'm getting ready to fly to Dubai. And I said, well, I'm going to Lincoln this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we have similar lives. <laughs> uh, but she called me one day and said, I, have, uh, I, I thought of this because of what you said about Mother Teresa. Because she said, I'm... I've been invited to Albania, and I'm 
flying over there to receive the Mother Teresa service to humanity. And I thought, what a what a great honor. And she has a connection with us all now. You know, she's very, very uh, appreciative. In fact, she invited Lurie and I, June 6th is uh, the invasion of Normandy, D-Day. And she's invited us to share with her at the uh, Eisenhower Museum in Abilene. And big, big doings down there. And it's, uh, it's pretty exciting for us country folks. So, you know, her son is actually going to Normandy and giving the keynote, which Mary used to do on those events, but she, she doesn't like to travel quite, quite as much anymore for some obvious reasons. Um, let's, let's pray again. Father, we want to thank you again for this day. We want to thank you for the rain. Uh, we wish it was a little warmer, and we pray for your, uh, your blessing on that. But in spite of that, uh, our wishes are not the most important thing in your will for this world because we continually ask you for guidance for this country, guidance for us as your people, that we can have the kind of influence for morality and for ethics and for spirituality and for belief in you that the world needs to see so desperately. As we look at uh, some people from history, the history in the Bible, that have impacts that uh, maybe we don't know so well. We ask your blessing on, on this day and on our study together that you would give us insight and things that we can learn that would help us be better servants of yours. Uh, bless this day. Bless us as we go forward in serving you. Be with our kids and our grandkids, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, we, uh, we left off yesterday with kind of a I, get this I learned a trick from Terry yesterday. I didn't know what he was looking for, but it was this thing, and I didn't know I could do this. So, um, we left off with a, kind of an overview of history. Um, and Could we do the lots again? Maybe. I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can't. <laughs> I need them back on. <laughs> yeah, that's why I did that in black and white, so I hope it would uh, be able to see the lights on. Um, there, there's a couple of things about Abner and, and Joab. The reason I was just going to talk about Joab, what did you say? Oh, okay. Um, the reason I was just going to talk about Joab, and then as the more I looked at the history between Abner and Joab, I thought these two are, are really a, a good study by themselves. And I, I want to preface this by saying the lessons that we learn from these people, I think, are sometimes, I, I, we look at them as stories, and I, I wonder if sometimes we don't overlook the message that is behind them. And I, I hope that... I hope that that comes out a little bit in the way we talk about it. But these stories are included for a reason. It's not just to give us a historical perspective. It's to show us some things that, uh, as God working through history, use lives and use people. And I, I have a lot of struggles with a lot of these Old Testament people. As I mentioned yesterday, most of them aren't good people. Uh, their perspectives are really skewed on the world and how they operate. I mean, if you can imagine in today's political climate, uh, the kind of things they did and the kind of things they espoused and the kind of things they did behind the scenes. Of course, they didn't have social media, so they got away with a lot more. You know, right now, anybody, anybody tries to do anything like they did, and there's gonna be somebody there with a cell phone taking a picture of it, and everybody's gonna know about it. And so these things are, uh, these things are, Kind of studies into. Just keep going. <laughs> oh, I thought it would just turn that off. No. Sorry. <laughs> no, it just turns it just turns that off. Um, so, when you look at them, the thing the thing that I hope you see is as life goes on, I think their values change. I think what impressed them, what they tried to accomplish, changed. Uh, they're all in some ways interrelated to each other. They all know each other, especially Abner and Joseph. They have a history together. But what they ended up doing was, uh, it's a mixture. They did some good things that they're, that they're uh, recognized for, but they also did some horrible things. And we'll see that especially with Joab. 
these are the two guys behind the throne. Now they start out as just military commanders, but as Saul becomes the king and as David becomes the king, uh, they become more than just the military commanders. They become not just commander in chief of the army, but they also become the advisor to the king. And especially in Joab's case, you'll find him pulling the strings a lot of times behind David, who is, it seems like, oblivious to a lot of what's going on in his own kingdom. And Joab has a lot of sway because David depends on Joab to say, you know, what are people thinking? What, what's the word on the street? But Joab does some despicable things in the name of the king that kind of uh, tarnish David's uh, reputation. I, I liken this in my own career. I'm not going to go into the story, but I, I think a lot of you know I never wanted to be a college president. Uh, most days still don't. <laughs> my job prior to this one was an executive vice president. And that job I enjoyed in a lot of ways a lot more because I'm not a public person. Uh, if, if you'll notice, uh, you know, if I'm in a crowd, I'm always on the edges. I'm not in the middle of it unless Crystal calls me up and makes a speech or something. Uh, I, just, I just don't gravitate to that. I don't enjoy it. I don't like the attention. I don't like the public aspects of that. Executive Vice President, you could get a lot done, and nobody knew you were there. <laughs> the only thing that I appreciate about being President, uh, I, I wouldn't say the only thing, but one of the things that is very different to me that I noticed right away, is all of a sudden I'm responsible for my own decisions, and not for somebody else's. As an Executive Vice President, sometimes I had to fulfill the obligations, or the promises, or the the policies, some of which I maybe didn't always completely agree with, but it was my job to make sure that that happened and it happened. And as I used to say when I was a dean of students, Catherine can uh, probably relate to this, I tell people there are some of our policies in our student handbook when I was a dean of students that I probably don't agree with, but if you know which ones they are, I'm not doing my job. Yeah. So, you know, Joab and, and Abner are kind of in this role, and they grow into this role. What happens is they actually go beyond fulfilling the desires of the leader and pushing their own agendas into the leader's uh, role. And so you will see in Abner's case, for example, he establishes Saul's son, Ishbosheth, on the throne, even though he knows David has been anointed as king because he wants to remain in, in power. So these two guys, um, it, it's kind of interesting. In, in 1 Samuel 17, I'm not going to read all these scriptures. I'm going to refer to several scriptures. In 1 Samuel 17, that's the story, you remember, of David and Goliath. Who in this room does not know the story? <laughs> okay, good. So I don't have to go into a lot. I'm, I'm, just, I'm going to make some assumptions that the basic parameters in the bold outlines of these stories you know. But it's very interesting that it, it goes back to David's family dynamic, and I, I love this story. I, I could spend a whole class on David and Goliath, but you know, David comes because Dad has sent up you know, some food for the for the brothers and to collect some of the spoils that he expects have already been taken from listings. And David gets there and about that time, Goliath walks out and he, uh, you know, he, he tells the Israelites, uh, you know, you're ugly, your mom dresses you funny. And, uh, and, uh, and then everybody just kind of goes out there and, and stamps the ground and shakes their spears and then they go back and play cards because nobody's going to go down there and, and face Goliath until David gets there. And you notice three times he asks this question, what's going to be done for the man who faces this giant? And three times he's told that well, he'll be given an inheritance, he'll marry the king's daughter, his family will be exempt from taxes in the land. And, and three times he asks that question. And, uh, you know, Saul hears about, hey, there's somebody at least asked him the question. <laughs> Bring him to me. And so he sees David, he's not impressed. And, and you know that, that part of the story. Eliab, the older brother, 
who is an interesting study in himself, but I don't think he's a hero, so I didn't really talk about him. But Eliam, he, he says, who do you think you are? You know, asking, and, and I love David's response, which is, you've heard from every teenager in your life. Uh, can I even talk? <laughs> yes, I love that phrase. And so David goes out, and of course you know what happens with Goliath. And it's interesting in that in the last part of, of first, uh, first Samuel 17, this is kind of intriguing to me. Um, Saul asks, basically here's the question, who is this guy? Well, he's talked with him a couple of times already. And evidently he never asked, well, who are you? Where are you from? But after he kills Goliath, all of a sudden he's interested. So Abner is the one who really introduces David to the king and says, uh, Saul says, who is this guy? Abner says, as surely as you live, O oh, king, I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, you think, with all that's going on prior to this, somebody at least know who, who David is, where he's from, who his father is. And the king said, Find out whose son this young man is. And as soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. <laughs> and so this is where Saul and David really get uh, get introduced to, to, to each other in, in, in this way, as a fighting man and as a person who's going to uh, be responsible for, for the armies. Um, Abner remains faithful to Saul's family even after Saul's death. And I've already mentioned this, uh, he establishes Isbosheth as king over Israel. Uh, and Isbosheth actually is, is able to carry out some, uh, some raids against the Philistines and gather some more land for the northern kingdom. But it, it's, you get the impression Isbosheth never leaves the house. Abner is the one who's doing all this work. And Abner and David have a history together of many years. Because when David was in the army, Abner was in charge of the army. And David evidently had a lot of respect for Abner. Uh, Abner is kind of, you'll see later, is kind of his hero. He's kind of the, uh, the one he looks up to throughout his, his military career. And this is interesting because Abner's trying to kill him a good part of this time. Uh, he's with Saul as Saul's going on these raids trying to find David uh, and, and evidently Abner is, is, is the right hand man next to Saul all the time trying to keep Saul safe. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm wondering where he is in the cave you know, when David comes and cuts off a part of the robe. Uh, but Abner is somewhere in that, in that picture. Uh, and, and David has just uh, unmitigated uh, respect for him. Well, you have this story in 2 Samuel chapter 2. Uh, and you might you might want to look at that. In fact, I think I printed some of that off so I can read it. Um, David is anointed king over Judah, and Abner has established Ishbosheth, as I mentioned, as the king of, of the northern. Um, it said Isbosheth was 40 years old when he became king over Israel, and he reigned for two years. So this is not a long, drawn-out affair. Uh, you remember we mentioned last time David is king in Hebron for seven years. And so during this time, there's this conflict going on. Who's going to actually be in charge? And looking back, we can see, well, of course we know what was supposed to happen. But during the time, people are kind of struggling with what is, what is God's will? Saul's the anointed one, and even David has said he's the anointed one. David is so reticent about doing anything to Saul or any of his family because he sees Saul as the Lord's anointed. I think part of the thing we were talking about, a man after God's own heart, is the fact that he was also anointed. But he doesn't, uh, you know, uh, Nick yesterday quoted uh, part of uh, Philippians chapter 2. He didn't count equality with Saul. Something that he should hang on to. He humbled himself. And throughout, uh, throughout this rocky relationship, I mean, Saul, how many times Saul tried to kill him? And, and David just still will not raise his hand against the Lord's anointing. I, I think that is uh, that's pretty phenomenal. Um, now, I do want to point out then that Joab enters the picture here as far as 
as far as what we know. Joab is the son of Zariah. Now this is interesting because Zariah had three sons, and they're all part of this, uh, all part of this process that we're going to see. But Zariah is not the father's name. We don't know who the father was. Anybody know who Zariah was? David's sister. David's sister. And so Zariah is, is David's sister. Joab is his nephew. And so it's very possible they're close in age because Zariah is probably older than David. Uh, don't know how much, but they're of similar age. And that, I think that comes into play because I mentioned David dies somewhere around 70, 74 years old. Joab's probably close to that age himself when Solomon takes over the kingdom and has Joab killed. So he has a long career, a long career serving David. Um, there is a story in chapter 2 of, of 2 Samuel about Abner's forces and Joab's forces meeting at the pool of Gideon. And I, I mentioned this briefly yesterday that they square off, they get 12 from each side, they square off and go after each other in all 24 kill each other. Twelve kill twelve. They all, it says they all fall. So nobody's the winner. So that then starts the battle. And it's kind of like, it's almost like Goliath. You know, you always send a champion out. Uh, you know, Goliath would come out and, and taunt the Israelites. And the whole idea is probably not so much in, in getting to Saul's thing. It's probably not so much that I expect David to kill Goliath. But that, that's going to start the battle because when they kill this poor little kid out here, you know, the army's going to get kind of revved up and, and we're going to get the battle started. And no one expects what happens with the class. Well, that's kind of what's going to happen here. These 12 men from each side are going to go meet each other and they're going to have this fight. And that's going to get the battle started. Well, they all kill each other. And then uh, Joab's people, uh, you know, his army goes after Abner and, and basically uh, wins the battle. But Abner runs away. And Asahel, I have that up to you. Yeah. Um, Asahel is one of the brothers of Joab, one of the three brothers. And he's the youngest brother, and he decides to go after Abner because if he can kill Abner, you know, that pretty much means the war is over. And Abner stops him twice in this, this account and says, Asahel, is that you following me? And he says, Yes, it is. I'm going to come after you and I'm going to kill you. And Abner says, depart, you know, go another direction because I don't want to have to kill you. And Asahel, uh, you know, kind of full of himself, says, no, I'm going, to, I'm going to come and get you. And he finally chases him down and gets him. And it says, Abner takes the butt, of, butt end of his spear and, and runs it through Asahel and kills him on the spot. And the, the, the body lays there. It says the armies go by and they all see Asahel. And it kind of, once again, gets them fired up for, for the battle. But that's not what Abner wanted. Uh, in fact, Joab pursues him, and Abner finally uh, yells at him across from the top of the mountain, saying, is this really what you want to have happen because of this revenge? You want to keep this battle going? Joab turns away and says, you know, I've been wrong about this, and he goes back to David. So Abner's still alive, but he's still fighting for Ishbosheth. He has Ishbosheth on, on the throne. Uh, but then Ishbosheth, and I've... I've I've seen this read two different ways. That Isbosheth accuses Abner of sleeping with his father's concubine. Now, one account I've read, and I kind of agree with, says Abner gets upset at this because he said, you know, that you're, you're calling me a dog, that I would do something so offensive as this. Uh, another account says uh, that they believe uh, Isbosheth and that that probably happened. Reminds me of the Brett Kavanaugh hearings. <laughs> you know, it's a he said, she said kind of thing. And we really don't know what happened one way or another. My, my personal opinion is that Abner is wounded by this because it's his reputation. <coughs> Let me just go aside here, because that's one of the things that worries me the most right now about our society and our culture and what we're living in. An accusation amounts to uh, a guilty verdict. And people really can't defend themselves. And I, I, I worry about this because there have been situations on this campus, not with our students, but with people that uh, uh, touch us, and touch our lives here, whose reputations are uh, questionable because someone has brought an accusation 
I don't know if the accusation is true or it's not. But it happens, and it's happening with more and more frequency in our society. And it scares me because somebody could pick anything out and say it about you and put it on social media, and all of a sudden it comes back. And you can never totally recover. That's worrisome to me because you don't really have to have proof anymore. You just have to have opinion. And so, you know, I hear, I, I guess it worries me as much hearing that on news broadcasts about this is, uh, you know, this is what this person did, and we know that the reason for them doing it. I thought, you don't know now. You don't have any idea. But people are convinced. Do you know where young people are getting most of their news these days? YouTube is the number one source of news for young people. They aren't watching the broadcasts on TV. They aren't listening to the radio. They're going to YouTube. And, of course, what they're doing is they're picking out whatever they agree with. And that's how. And, and so we wonder how this society we're getting is becoming so divisive. You know, a lot of it's uh, a lot of it's because of the way we get our way we get our news. Um, so anyway, uh, Abner kills Asa Hill, and Joab never forgets this. Um, chapter three. It says the war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Ishbosheth then makes this accusation against Abner. And Abner was angry, it says in chapter 3, because of what Ishbosheth said. So he answered, Am I a dog's head on Judah's side? This very day I'm loyal to the house of your father Saul and to his family and friends. I haven't, and I haven't handed you over to David, yet you now accuse me of an offense involving this woman. May God deal with Abner and be never so severely if I don't do for David what the Lord promised him of an oath. That part to me was interesting because he already knew what God promised him. And he hasn't been a part of it until now. Now he goes over to David. Uh, Samuel chapter 3. Um, Isbosheth did not dare to say another word to Abner because he was afraid of him. That phrase is important. We're going to see a similar phrase about Joab from David. That the kings are afraid of these military commanders who are actually running, running the kingdom, making public policy. So Abner sends a message to David and says, I want to meet with you. So he brings, uh, he brings 20 men and he goes and sees David. Uh, David said, I'll make an agreement with you, but I demand one thing. Don't come into my presence unless you bring Michael daughter of Saul, when you come to see him. Remember who Michael is? David's, David's very first wife. So David sent messengers to Isbosheth at that time, and he, said to Is and he says to Isbosheth, give me my wife, for I mean, I betrothed myself for the price of a hundred listing foreskin. So Isbosheth gave orders and had her taken away from her husband, Paltiel. Her husband, however, went with her, weeping behind her all the way to the room. Then Amner said to him, go back home. So he turned and he went back home. So Abner comes and meets with David. Michael is, is there, so that satisfies David's condition. And David, David kind of makes peace with Abner. And he tells Abner to go home. Well, then Joab comes. He's been out on a campaign, and he comes back in, and he says, what, what, did, what did you agree to? And David said, Abner is going to join our forces, and Joab says, don't you know that he was just scouting you out to see where your weak points were because now he's going to come and attack you. And so David says, well, go and bring him back. Mm -hmm. So Joab goes and gets him. Um, let's see. And he takes him to Hebron. And he meets with him privately. And he kills him. So Abner thinks that there's going to be this reconciliation that everything's going to be. And remember, he didn't want to kill Asaph. If Asaph hadn't pursued him, he wouldn't have killed him. But, but Joab has taken this personally, and so now Joab uh, kills Abner. And this really could have been uh, could have been a de defeating kind of thing, but David turns it into something great. Um, David mourns for Abner, and he says, tear your clothes and put on sackcloth in 1 Samuel 3. And walk in mourning in front of Abner. <coughs> King David himself walked behind the bier. 
they burned Abner and he buried Abner in Hebron, and the king wept aloud at Abner's tomb. All the people wept also. Abner was a kind of a folk hero in, in the land of Israel. And, you know, we're going we're to talk about Michael in a minute, kind of what happened to get her where she was in history. But at the same time, Abner is, uh, has been with Saul all the time as the people watched God establish the first unified kingdom. It wasn't just Saul they were looking at, but it was the influence of, of Ab Abner who still had that influence even after Saul died. Um, they all came and urged David to eat something while it was still David. David took an oath saying, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I taste bread or anything else before the sun sets." <laughs> all the people, this is, a, I think, a telling phrase, took note and were pleased. Indeed, everything the king did pleased him. This is why David is so loved. He's not a good ruler, not a good father, but he has these instincts, he has the spirituality, he has this love for God, he has this humility that, that makes him the kind of person that people respected and loved. So on that day, all the people there in Israel knew the king had no part in the murder of Abner, son of Nur. Then the king said to his men, Do you not realize that a commander and a great man has fallen in Israel this day? And today, though I am the anointed king, I am weak. These sons of Zariah are too strong. You notice that phrase? These sons of Zariah, my, my nephews, <laughs> are, are hard to deal with. May the Lord repay the evil who are according to his evil deeds. So, that introduces us kind of to Joab, who is uh, who's related to David. He becomes the right-hand man. He is leading the armies. And I've already talked about Joab recently on Abner. Uh, he is also the one who David goes after he sees Bathsheba. And he says, I need you to put Uriah at the front of the, of the war so he can get killed. Uh, so I can, I can take care of this situation with Bathsheba. And it's, now I think there's probably, we'll see it probably tomorrow, maybe maybe we'll get to the day. There are probably other people in the palace who have some knowledge of this, but for the most part, Joab carries out, I mean, this once again, uh, David doesn't condemn Joab for Uriah's death because he commanded it. But he does condemn him for the deaths of Abner and then later for Mason. Oops, sorry, did I hit, hit a button when I didn't come over? Okay. Um, so Joab, uh, during the time, and I, I'm, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Later on then, during the uh, rebellion of Absalom, this is an interesting story that, uh, that you'll see, um, let's see, I don't, I don't have passages for you down here. Well, it's in 2 Samuel, what, uh, I'll, I'll have to look up the passages later. If you want to look up Joab and Absalom, when Absalom's rebellion starts, before the rebellion starts, if, if you remember the situation, uh, Am, Amnon has uh, raped his sister Tamar, who is Absalom's sister. Okay, you got that that part so far. I mean, you can imagine what this household is like. And so Absalom waits a couple of years. And then invites all the sons of David over to his house for barbecue or whatever. And he invites David as well. And David says, no, you, you've got enough problems without having the king come to your house. So he doesn't show up when the sons go. And Absalom uses that opportunity to kill Amnon. And all the rest of the, all the, rest of the kids flee because they think he's going to kill them as well. Why would he want to do that? Yeah, see, if you look at these, if you look from one king to another, you find a lot of this genocide going on because you want to wipe out a line. And that's that's why, for example, Mephibosheth uh, is, is blessed by David because he's killed all the rest of Saul's kids. And Mephibosheth is the only, the son of Jonathan is the only one left and he wants to show something good. We're going to talk about him uh, hopefully as well. So. All the rest of the kids flee, and David has brought the message. 
uh, whoever posted this on the internet got it wrong and said, all your children have been killed. And David is in mourning, and then someone comes in and says, no, they're not all killed, just Amnon, and the rest of the kids are, are safe, and they're coming home right now. And so David banishes Absalom, and he goes to live with his father-in-law. And he's there for, for quite a period of time. But Absalom is the one who's, excuse me, Joab is the one that's responsible for bringing Absalom back to David. And first of all, he says, you know, you've grieved enough over Amnon. It's time to bring Absalom back. And David says, okay, he can come back, but I don't want to see his face again. And after a while, uh, Absalom once again goes through, and, and the Joab does this through a, a pretty sneaky way, but I, I won't go into all the details. I just want to get, get the high points. Absalom then says, well, I might as well still be banished. If I can't see the king's face. So David invites him back to the palace and they kind of make amends. And this is now where Absalom starts undermining the king's authority. He sits at the gates of the city, he talks to people about how bad the king is doing, and if he were king, you know, that, that things would be a lot better. And basically he steals, it says he steals the hearts of the people. Uh, and David, uh, David is unaware that any of this is going on, and even Joab is surprised by it. Because when Absalom mounts his rebellion, Joab evidently is, is kind of shocked by this. And he realizes that he has unintentionally been instrumental in bringing about this revolt. Now, I'll have to tell you, Absalom, I mentioned this yesterday, Absalom seems to have the patience. Uh, it's just done, I mean, it takes him years with some of these machinations that he's got going in, in play. Yeah, and, but he's not just a manipulator, he's, he's, very, he's, he's very strategic about it, and he also is not in a hurry. He's very methodical. Methodical, manipulative, I think all those, those, those things fit him, but he's still David's favorite kid, yeah. you know, and that's, that's, what's, that's what's kind of made. You know, isn't this true? They're always your kids, no matter what they do, no matter how they yeah. live their lives, uh, no matter how much you wish they were a different person. Or how, or how old they get. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I was impressed, to, a couple of things impressed me at, at Todd's funeral. And one, of, one is this guy right here, uh, talking about unsung heroes who gets up. It was touching to me when he said, I pray for my kids every day. And I think, well, I do too, but there was something in, in that statement, Ted, that really hit me because you pray for my name, my situation, what's going on. And sometimes I just say, be with my grandkids today. Well, ever since that funeral, I've changed my prayers. And it's good to be. Mm -hmm. So, David, you know, has a special son who's the one who's out to get him. It, it appears like Absalom doesn't have much of a conscience. <laughs> uh, his conscience is based in revenge. You know, he wants to get Anna because of his sister Tamar, who it says lives in the palace the rest of her life and never marries. You know, she, she's a ruined woman. And so he's got some justification in what he, what he does, but at the same time, the way he goes about it is underhanded and is sneaky. It is not, uh, you know, he's not just trying to get out there and, and take charge. He's trying to do it in a way that he's pretty sure of himself when he starts the uh, starts the rebellion. Uh, I hope I get a chance to talk about Hittophel and Husai, who come in later to this because that's an interesting this side of this. Well. This is, why this is interesting is that David has already started losing confidence in Joab by this time. I don't know if it's because of his age, I don't know if it's because of the stuff he's gone through with Joab, but Joab is no longer commander of the whole army. The army is divided into three different uh, segments. One under Gittai, the Gittite, which would be a good, I keep thinking that name would be great in a rap song. <laughs> anyway, um, Abisha and Joab. So Joab is one of three commanders. And, you know, David uh, 
David Finn has it all, and he tells all three of them, if you find my son Absalom, please be gentle with him. You know, because I love my son, and he'll have to be punished for this, but I want him back. Well, who finds him? Joab, what does he do? Kills him. You know, says, put three darts in, three spears, three arrows, whatever, whatever they are. And he kills him. And, and uh, you know, David, of course, mourns that. And then Joab's the one who says, hey, get over it. He led a rebellion against you. The people want, want to uh, see you up leading, leading the nation again. And so Joab even robs David in some ways of his grief. Um, and you know David grieves because remember Bathsheba's first child at times. You know, he, won't, uh, he, he won't eat, he won't drink, he won't do anything until that, that baby uh, passes away. So at this point, Amasa is made the commander of the armies. Joab still is not so back in the role that he was. Obviously, he's a little older now. Well, in 2 Samuel 20, Joab, Amasa is given a task to, uh, to go put down a rebellion of Sheba. And for some reason, he delays in doing that. So Joab takes over and goes and, and starts the attack. Amasa comes up and Joab kills him. So you notice. Really liked killing, really. Well, that's the way. Really. Yeah, that's the way you got rid of opposition. Yeah. You didn't sit down over a table and talk about it. You didn't. Uh, you didn't impose sanctions. Uh, you just. Uh, you just killed him. And so you're going to see. You're going to see when David gives the command to Solomon. It's interesting to me that he doesn't say, "I want you to make sure Joab dies because of Abner and Absalom." He says, I want you to make sure Joab dies because of Abner and Mason. And so these commanders, and so then Joab takes over the role of commander in chief in the army once again. He puts himself back into that role. And David evidently doesn't have enough power to tell him he can't do it. I mean, that's a very interesting dynamic that I don't fully understand. But he is the one in 2 Samuel 24 when David says, I want to count the, I want to take a census, I want to count the fighting men. And remember, there's been prohibitions against that. And Joab is the one who says, you shouldn't do that. You don't need to do that. So there's, at the same time, there's this sensitivity to, to God's will and to God's command that Joab has that even David, you know, it, you realize, don't you, that none of these guys ever read the Old Testament. <laughs> so a lot of the things that we take for granted that they should have known uh, are not, you know, I, I think of when they, when they come back from the exile and they start reinventing temple worship because no one has ever <coughs> seen temple worship. And they have to go back and find the law and, and read it. And, uh, you know, this happens periodically through Israel's history where they just kind of forget and, and so there's no uh, there's there's no really way to look at this except Joab seems to have a better sensitivity for it than David does. Um, but then later, as David it says as he is waning, he's become weak, he's bedfast. Uh, they have this uh, servant girl, Abishag, who is brought to him to keep him warm at night. Uh, don't know what else she did, but there's something going on there. But. Um, at this time, Adonijah, who's the, another one of David's sons, uh, is not necessarily taking the throne, but Joab is ready to put him on the throne. And so at this point, you remember, this is when Bathsheba comes to David and said, you need to make a decision before you die, where you still got your mental faculties, you need to establish who is going to be the next king, where there's going to be war in, in the country. And so that's when David names Solomon. As, as the king. And so, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, why was there an objection to a census? The, the Old Testament prohibition, I have to look it up because I don't remember where it is, maybe, maybe Terry has it on the top of his head. Uh, 
it, it deals with the fact that they were never supposed to take a census because God was their ruler and he was going to take care of them. Mm -hmm. David is taking a census because he wants to describe how big his army is. Oh, okay. And so it's a matter of, it's a matter of pride and it's in some ways like Saul when he <coughs> offers the, uh, the sacrifice without waiting for Samuel because he's taking the role that was not, not given to him. God has said, I will be, I will fight for you. You don't, need, you don't ever need to. And there's no standing army during this time. I guess we realize that. The, when we talk about these armies, these are volunteers that, that come out of Judah and come out of the other nation, the other tribe of Israel to, to follow their king. But there isn't a standing army that's in place that's a military base somewhere being fed and clothed and housed and all those kind of things. It's just a, it's just a volunteer group. That, the numbers seem phenomenal. You know, sometimes you read about the thousands of people that show up in these battles. But uh, they are all people that are coming to support their cause. So David's charge to Solomon. Now you yourself know what Joab, son of Bri, did to What he did to the two commanders of Israel, <coughs> Abner, son of Ner, and the Mason, son of Jesus. He killed them, shedding their blood. And I told you yesterday, this is, this is a pivotal passage to the seventies when I was uh, eligible for the draft. Shedding their blood in peacetime as if in battle. So there is a difference between <laughs> battle and murder, okay? That's what David is pointing out. Uh, and with that blood, he stained the belt around his waist and the sandals on his feet. Deal with him according to your wisdom, but don't let his gray hair, his gray head, go down to the grave in peace. Make sure he has a violent death. Wow. Uh, it's kind of... <laughs> You didn't want to make David mad. I mean, he's probably not going to take care of it, but he's going to make sure it gets done. And so that's uh, that's the charge that he gives to Solomon. Um, and so in, in 1 Kings chapter 2, excuse me, chapter 1, no, King, 1 Kings chapter 2, here's the scenario here. Adonijah has been stripped of power. He's no longer uh, vying to be the king because David has said, my heir is going to be Solomon. And so uh, Adonijah, previous to this passage, has come <coughs> to Bathsheba and said, would you make a request to the king? Uh, well, she goes to Solomon and he says, mom, whatever you want. You know, he has a throne brought, sat next to his throne, says, mom, whatever you want, that's what you're going to have. And so she says, well, I would like a the Shunammite, to be given to Adonijah. That's David's concubine in his later years that kept him warm at night. And evidently, uh, Adonijah is smitten by her. And he says, why do you request that? You might as well request the kingdom. <laughs> after, he is, after all, he is my older brother. Yes, for him and for Abiah for peace. And Joab, son of Jeriah. In other words, if I give in to this request, I'm giving in to a request for people who opposed my kingship, that opposed David, that uh, have tried to topple the kingdom. If you're going to ask for that, I might as well just give it all over to him. And so King Solomon swore by the Lord, may God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if Adonijah does not pay with his life for this request. And now as surely as the Lord lives, he who established me securely on the throne of my father David has found a dynasty for me as he promised. Adonijah shall be put to death today. So Solomon gave orders to Benaiah, son of Jehiah, and he struck down Adonijah and he died. Uh, well, you know, just, uh, there's a lot of that going on. <laughs> to Abiathar, the priest, the king said, Now I'm going to let you go back to, to Anathoth, where you came from. You deserve to die. But I'm not going to put you to death because you carry the ark of the Lord before my father David and shared my father's hardships. So when the ark came back to Jerusalem, uh, he was the priest of the time. So Sol Solomon removed him from the priesthood, fulfilling the word the Lord spoke to Shiloh about the house of Eli. You have to go long, back a long way for that one, but he said the, the priesthood is going to depart from your family because you have not raised your kids right. And so this is how that takes place. When the news reached Joab, who had conspired with Adonijah, but not with Absalom, he fled to the tent of the Lord and took hold of the horns of the altar. Now this, to me, is kind of interesting because when King Solomon was told that, he ordered Benaiah to go strike him down. So Benaiah entered the tent of the Lord and said, the king says, come out. He said, no, I'll die right here. So Benaiah said, this is how Joab answered. 
The king said, well, do as he says. Go in, and go in the temple, strike him down. The Lord will repay him for the blood he shed because without my father David knowing it, he attacked two men and killed them with a sword, both of them, Abner, son of Ner, commander of Israel's army, and Amasa, son of Jesus, commander of Judah's army, were better men and more upright than he was. Now, if, there, if you think there's any problem with this, Exodus 21, anyone who strikes a person with a fatal blow is to be put to death. However, if it is not done intentionally, but God lets it happen, they're to flee to place out of destiny. But if anyone schemes and kills someone deliberately, that person is to be taken from my altar and put to death. So actually, it's, it's, it's fitting right in with the scriptures. So Benaiah went up and struck down Joab and killed him. He was buried in his home mountain country. The king put Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, over the army. And Joab's position in place of Biathar was that our priest. Now, I plan to go into a long discussion with Michael and uh, Abigail, but we're out of time. So, uh, you know, I, I just want to come back around to this. The reason I put these as unsung heroes is both of these guys and David are flawed people. Sometimes they did the right thing. Sometimes they didn't. I, I remember one time years ago we were having a, 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 I was preaching at this church and somebody called for a teacher's meeting. And uh, I, I went to the teacher's meeting, and I noticed Doug was there. I don't remember Doug's last name. Doug was the old uh, grumpy guy you have in every church. He kind of, uh, you know, wants to get on everybody's case. And I thought, why is Doug here? He doesn't teach me. And this is basically for elementary classes. And they went through their meeting, and Doug said, I've got something to say. And uh, I thought, oh, no, here it comes. And so Doug, uh, Doug said, you know, I, I want to talk to you teachers because these kids, after they get out of class, they're running through the halls. They almost knock down a little old lady, you know, walking down the hall every day. And you need to spend more time teaching them manners and how to act in the house of God. And uh, Carolyn Raymond stood about that tall, <laughs> been a teacher for years, got up and, and said, Doug, I get these kids for 45 minutes a week. I can't in 45 minutes overcome all that's been happening in their homes, all that's happening in the school, all the things they run into, all the things that they deal with. I can just tell them about Jesus. I'm not going to give up telling them about Jesus to talk to them about their manners. Someone came and talked to me after that in the office and said, what are we going to do about Doug? And I said, we're going to love him. Well, what are we going to do about his attitude? I said, we're going to appreciate the fact that he is telling us something that we need to know that people are thinking about. But I also think we need to understand, I don't know how much God can forgive. I don't know how much attitude he can overcome. I don't know what allowances he can make. All I know is I hope it's a lot. <laughs> and we're all different people. We all come from different walks of life. We all have different standards for propriety. <clears throat> manners. But the one thing we have in common is we serve a God who loves us. And He's going to overlook if we're in a relationship with Him. He's going to overlook all these all these things that get in our way. You know, a couple times I've said in prayer and people have called me on it. <laughs> God, give us the wisdom to overcome our opinions. And I think a lot of times we develop these thought processes because we're in one political spectrum or another or we're with one cause or another. You know, I didn't, I didn't agree with the policies of Obama. I'll have to tell you that. I'm a pretty strong Republican. But when people would come and say to me, in fact, it's kind of like, uh, remember John McCain? When some, one time somebody said, well, he's, uh, he wasn't born in the United States, he's a Muslim, and he's godless, and, and John McCain said, stop right there. You, know, he, I, you don't know any of that. I have, to, I have to think that he was honest in what he did. I just disagree with his positions. And 
boy, we need to get closer to that rather than be writing and be rating. And I look at these guys, and I look at David, the man after God's own heart. Man, he made a lot of mistakes. And he had people around him that were not necessarily good people, but at times, they were great people. And how much can God forgive? Well, he can forgive anything that I've done as long as I remain in a relationship with him. And so I think the key for us going forward is that we need to understand that with all these people. When I talk about unsung heroes, I thought when I was going to get into this that I found people that were all good. <laughs> and as, as I look deeper in their lives, there are a few, and the reason they're all good is because we don't know anything about them. <laughs> maybe one act that they accomplished. But you look at the, a lot of the other people, and they're human beings, just like you are, and I am, and the people around us, and the people that sometimes we disagree with. It, it's not that God doesn't love us, or that He doesn't love them. It's that He puts up with all this stuff because He loves us so much. And so, you know, I think for today, uh, I'm about five minutes over, so we'll leave it there and yeah. we'll come back and talk about some more tomorrow. Uh, I can't tell you, I'm kind of like Terry, I, I guess uh, four or five chapters I'm going to have to leave out. <laughs>